Hi everyone. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> Welcome back. So I have discovered the importance of an intro to a podcast as I listen to more podcasts. Yeah. I understand that it's important to be consistent with the intro, which you do very well. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you say which I do really well? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I you just do, you do the intros very well. My default well. is to, you know, thank people for things. You're very good at it. Because I can't hear that well. Okay, before we get into this topic. <laughs> this is off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, okay, question. Okay. What song are you currently digging? Mm, can you go first while I think about it? Yeah, or it can be any type of music, artist, whatever, because I'm currently getting really into Genesis because I'm a huge Phil Collins person, and so I'm, I, I've am i known for many years that he was a part of Genesis, but now I'm like really starting to dive deep into Genesis, and Raul's looking at me like, yes, where have you been? <laughs> yes. But I'm really like getting deep into Genesis. I knew they were popular songs, but I'm like diving in. I'm so proud of you. That's some good Thank stuff you. right there, Katie. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'll tell you what song I'm not digging right now. <laughs> that McDonald's filet o fish song. That is horrible. Give me that fish. Paging Adam Kasky, who thinks that that's the best song. It's the worst. It's really bad. And he sings it at us at a loud volume in between the commercials. Because we, what we do on TV is we rest during the commercial breaks or we get our show together or something. But then that song, give me that play fish, give me that fish. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's it's hor so I'm not digging that one. Nope. I am, however, really love, I don't know why, but that song, I love you always forever near and far close. That's kind of an oldie and. too. Not it's a, from the 90s. Yeah. But for some reason, I'm just loving it. And I've been listening to it. It's to a like happy song. Me up. Yeah. It's a happy song. I like it. I like it. I okay. like it. Okay. Well, that was a great question. Yeah. All right. But this is, you know, Whatever the Weather, a podcast where Katie and I, shout out Katie. Shout out Sarah. <laughs> talk about <laughs> the weather and different weather phenomena. And something in recent history of the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. have been bomb cyclones. And we're saying that with big quotation marks bomb cyclones. I feel weird saying this because we work at a TV station, mm -hmm. but like the media took this bomb cyclone thing and just like ran with it. It was like on the national news, like bomb cyclone threatens 87 million people. And it's like, these happen not often, but they've happened a lot before. I mean, this is not a new thing. Well, and the, and the thing is, is, is it's, it was a dangerous storm, yes, and it needed yes. some attention, right? But I've noticed that sometimes what big national media will do is they'll take a phrase that we use in meteorology mm -hmm. and they will, you know, create kind of their own definition or their own slogan. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about why was it even called a bomb cyclone in the first place? Well, it had to do with the meteorology term that we use every now and then called explosive cyclogenesis. Yes. And explosive makes you think of what? Bombs. Okay. Yes. All right. We're going to talk all about it. I've got kind of the definition of a bomb cyclone because we've got, we've got to start there. So before we talk about a bomb cyclone or an explosive cyclone. I want to go back and quickly talk about what is a cyclone because I think some people, if they hear the word cyclone, they think something that only happens in another part of the world or maybe some people even think a tornado or a yeah. twister or something like that. Um, so a cyclone is simply an area of low pressure spinning counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere whoop, whoop. or clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Shout out Australia. Yes. So things are backward in the southern hemisphere when it comes to meteorology. It makes my head hurt to think about that, but we'll have to do it an episode on how things yeah, the are re different. If you are weather savvy, the reason why cyclones spin opposite direction in the southern hemisphere is because of something called the Coriolis effect. But we shall talk about that later. Yes. So what you need to know if you're in the northern hemisphere is that a cyclone is an area of low pressure spinning counterclockwise. Um, this includes 
tropical cyclone. So our, our hurricanes, our yeah. tropical storms are technically tropical cyclones. Mm -hmm. Also a whole other podcast topic. It includes those systems. It also includes something called mid-latitude cyclones. And we we'll, we deal with these a lot more often than you may think. A mid-latitude cyclone is just a cyclone, low pressure center, spinning counterclockwise, that occurs in the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Right. If I may add, it's something that you as a viewer at home may recognize as a simple big red L across parts of the United States. Yeah. So it's most in North America. It's like our northern Mex Mexico, all of the United States, and then most of Canada. If this system forms in that range, it's a mid-latitude cyclone. So these are the low pressure systems, like Sarah was saying, the big red L on our weather maps that typically have fronts attached to them, a warm front, cold front, an occluded front, a stationary front. And these are also the big weather systems that produce um, very strong winds. If they're, you know, if it's a really, really strong system like the one we were talking about, they have really tight pressure gradients, so that causes issues with wind, but then they also produce precipitation, rain, ice, snow, even thunderstorms, severe weather, things like that. And the process by which these cyclones form is called cyclogenesis. Cyclone, cyclogenesis, you see? When you think of genesis, what do you think of, Katie? <laughs> Phil Collins. That, no. but also like creation, yes. right? Yes. Uh, first thing that happens. And so cyclogenesis is the creation or the formation of cyclones. Yes, and it's, we could probably, again, do it. We will have to do another podcast episode on just cyclogenesis itself because it's very fascinating. So. Cyclogenesis has to do with different air masses coming together. Um, we've got we've got to consider the upper levels of the atmosphere, things called convergence, divergence, etc. But anyway, that's how a cyclone forms. So a cyclone that has a pressure drop of at least 24 millibars in a span of 24 hours undergoes something called bomb cyclogenesis or explosive cyclogenesis okay so it's cyclogenesis so the formation of a cyclone but it's a rapid intensification or rapid strengthening of a cyclone and because of this it may be dubbed or called a bomb cyclone it's kind of like slang yeah because it's cooler to say bomb cyclone, Dude, <laughs> cyclone instead look at of that massive bomb cyclone yeah over there. <laughs> that's kind of what it is. it's much more catchy to say bomb instead yeah. of I mean, explosive is cool too. I don't know why we didn't run with explosive cyclone, but that's not up to me, I guess. Um, so how does this ex intense and extreme strengthening happen? It has to come from a lot of upper level support, so the winds and the upper levels of the atmosphere, um, and or interaction with water. Um, sometimes we have these mid-latitude cyclones that skim the East Coast, interact with the Atlantic Ocean, and that intensification um, there, sometimes they can what we would say bomb out there, intensify, and those become our nor'easters. Yeah, it's and that's they. one of the reasons why they intensify is because the moisture in the Atlantic Ocean acts as like one ingredient that's just pumping a lot of moisture into the system mm -hmm. so that it could produce some rain, right? So yeah, so a lot of the bomb cyclones tend to be nor'easters because they interact with water, but the one that happened most recently didn't. This system was just, I mean, from bottom to top, like just stacked. I mean, it was, we could see several days out that this was gonna be an intense mid-latitude cyclone. And sure enough, it was intense enough that it, it had that pressure drop within the 24 hour span and technically was an e explosive cyclone yeah. or a bomb cyclone. And the technical, the technical definition for it to be called bombing out or intensifying mm -hmm is 24 millibars within 24 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. So we use millibar as like a form of pressure uh, measurement. And usually the atmosphere sits at about 100 and, uh, sorry, 1,013 millibars. Mm -hmm. But mid-latitude cyclones can have as low as pressure as like category three hurricanes yeah. on land. So that's like 950 millibars of pressure, which is way lower than that normal of 1013. Yeah, so when that when the pressure gets lower, that means the system is stronger. And I think some people may associate that with we have a big storm system coming in, they may get headaches. I think some people are like arthritis. Yes. And it's all due to the, the drop in pressure. 
It's pretty intense. Yeah. Well, that was neat. So that's kind of the kind of the setup there. Okay, cool. So thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about a couple of bomb cyclones or explosive cyclones uh, that have affected uh, our United States of America. And um, the oldest one that I could find, full disclosure here, I left one of my sheets of paper at my desk, but not to worry because <laughs> I'm so fascinated by it. I'm pretty sure I have the knowledge in my mind. Off. I really did. I left it though, but it's okay. So you, back, yeah. no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this all from memory. Okay. I I've believe. got a couple of sheets here. Back in 1880, there was something called the Great Gale of 1880. Okay. You know it was in 1880 when they call a storm a gale. gale. Think of anybody who uses that name, I mean that phrase, yeah. gale. To talk about. Wind. Other yeah. than like if you have an ant gale or something. You really don't. Okay. So, the Great Gale of 1880 was an extremely intense mid-latitude cyclone, high five, Go for it, okay. Possibly deeper than 955 millibars of pressure. That is. That's, yes, that's really, really low for us. Let okay? me get ears pop. It will. That impacted the northwestern United States back on January 9th of 1880. Wow. This was post-Civil War in the northwestern part of the United States, so Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. So think about it. This was back when like Lewis and Clark were getting up there. It was when the Oregon Trail was happening. You remember that game, right? In high school or in yes. middle school when you would pit, play the bad. Oregon Trail and you yep. would die from dysentery or mm -hmm. something randomly. Okay, this was the RIP Oregon Trail um, and Katie from dysentery. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so th that's just imagine that. Okay, there yeah. is there was no way for people to forecast back in that yeah. day. Kind of reminds me of when we were talking about that massive flood that mm -hmm. happened in Pennsylvania. Here is an excerpt from uh, somebody who experienced a blizzard from this storm system. I'm going to use a good voice for this. On the ninth. At 2 o'clock p.m., a storm of snow and wind set in and continued for two hours with all the fury of a hurricane. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they um, have a transatlantic accent, but we're going to go with that. I like okay. it. Uh, uh, also, this is really interesting. Surprisingly, not that many people passed away from this storm. I think it has to do with the fact that the area was not as extremely populated. Sure. I think there were there handfuls of reports of uh, about, you know, up to 10 to 20 deaths, but nothing like what we saw in Galveston from the hurricane back in 1900. Yeah. Here's another quote uh, from uh, the Oregonian on January 17th, about a week later. We have just experienced one of the severest gales, again that word, Nothing like it has occurred since the settlement of the bay. It was southeast, lasted about five hours, and it was a terrible force. The tide rose seven feet higher than it was ever known. Nearly all the old decks and wharves were taken away. Wow. So it's pretty crazy that, you know, system like this that is cold core, not technically a hurricane, can produce um, mm -hmm. surges storm surges of up to seven feet, just like a hurricane would do. And as far as the historic ranking of this storm system goes, it's believed that it's about, uh, you know, one of the one of the strongest storms ever on record wow. in the United States. Okay. So that was back in 1880. I'm going to go a little bit more recent within our lifetimes, okay, to the superstorm of 1993. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Do you remember learning about this? And I remember learning about yes. it in, in college because mm -hmm. it's such an example of an extreme mid-latitude cyclone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how old were you in 1993? March of 1993. Um, coming up on one, one year. Coming up on one of year. Of life. Raul, how old were you in 1993? Um, 16. 16. So Raul was, uh, you know, in high school. I was also coming up on one year of life. <laughs> um, and I was in Kansas City at the time. Where were you at the time? H-Town. H-Town. Raul, where, where are you? San Antonio. San Antonio. So 
we y'all were in Texas, I was in Kansas City, we would not have been affected directly by this storm system. Okay, okay? the areas that were aff affected directly by the storm system were the deep south, mm -hmm. all the way up to Maine uh, in the northeastern part of the United States. Okay. So really what happened was on March 12th, which was a Friday night, mm -hmm. uh, before that, about five days before that, meteorologists saw that our forecasting models were hinting at a very weak low pressure system developing in Texas, okay, okay close to the Gulf. And they saw that it rapidly would intensify and become an issue for Florida and become a major snowstorm. But this was 26 years ago. This was when forecasting models were not good at all. Mm -hmm. So meteorologists as a collective at first looked at that and was like, <laughs> that, that will never happen, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Okay, what ended up happening though is that this storm intensified to the point of uh, being responsible for over 300 deaths. Jeez. And in retrospect, uh, the meteorologists were able to get out warnings faster because the models showed that it was going to intensify. And in retrospect, this was the first example of our forecasting models being right about a severe storm five days out. Wow. This was the first example. And it was only 26 years ago, in Katie. In 93. In 93. Think about the ways that forecasting has improved in just 26 years. Mm -hmm. Now we can see the potential for a severe storm two weeks out. Mm -hmm. And you can only imagine where we'll be 26 years from now. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty about this storm. So again, Friday, March 12th, it intensified very rapidly, getting down to a pressure of 960 millibars. Wow. And what happened was a squall line developed on the west coast of Florida. It produced wind gusts of up to 110 miles per hour. And that pressure being so low was similar to a category three hurricane. Yeah. So people in Florida, call, we call this in, in history, uh, the, super, the um, uh, storm of the century, okay? But people in Florida called it the no-name hurricane, even though it technically was not a hurricane yeah, because it didn't develop in the tropics. Because they needed to prepare for wind and like right. you were talking wind about the and surge rain. and stuff, yeah. This is pretty crazy because an estimated 15 tornadoes struck Florida with over 59,000 cloud to ground lightning strikes. Good grief. And 44 deaths were attributed to either tornadoes or just strong wind gusts in Florida itself. A 12-foot storm surge also occurred in Taylor County, Florida, resulting in at least seven deaths. Wow. So to people in Florida, this was had the impact of a hurricane. Yeah. Okay, but they weren't as well prepared because hurricanes, we can see them forming long before they've made it to mm -hmm. land. This one kind of formed really, really quickly. It quote unquote bombed out, mm -hmm. okay, within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, on top of that, this was also a very massive storm, uh, snowstorm event. Places from Maine all the way down to Louisiana got snow. That's crazy. One of those places that got a ton of snow was in Tennessee, and it got 60 inches of snow, which <laughs> is five feet of snow in Tennessee. 60 inches. Yeah, pretty in incredibly. Incredible, actually. Okay, so something that's interesting is that the storm ha caused the most weather-related flight cancellations in U.S. history to this day. That storm is the most. The Coast Guard rescued more than 160 people at sea and in the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico where at least one freighter sank. However, about 48 people were reported missing at sea. Oh That's gosh. where most of the deaths occurred and most of the in, and stuff occurred is offshore because we had a lot of people that were not prepared for hurricane strength, winds and stuff like that. Sure. And to this day, it is the costliest storm in US records with over about $5 billion of damage. So in terms of flooding and was it most intense when it was coming like out of the did it skim the gulf and then the flooding was most intense on the west coast of florida okay when it acted like a hurricane that was in the gulf of okay. mexico okay and then as it gained that strength and that intensity from the atlantic it continued to just dump snowfall mm -hmm. across parts of uh you know maine all the way down to atlanta atlanta georgia was totally crippled by this system wow yeah, and so again, a really intense storm. We call it the storm of the century for a reason. That's crazy. Yeah.
No more, no, no more of that. I did that from memory. Boop, boop. Good for you. See, well, good chunk I knew of it. it would be fine. That's what's really cool about mid-latitude cyclones, and I love talking about them on air because if you're kind of in the middle of one of these low pressure systems moving across the country, you can just, you know, you can break down the, the warm side of the system, which is where we would see maybe rain, mm -hmm. um, some severe weather, things mm -hmm. like that. And then on the back side, you've got the cold side, which is a whole other. Oh, and speaking of that cold side, so we here in Texas were on the cold side of that system. Our uh, former colleague who retired, Steve Brown, uh -huh. has records of what the weather was like in San Antonio on That's this right. day. By the way, we had record lows on that day. We got down to 27 degrees in the morning, which is pretty cold for San Antonio. Oh my on that day in March, Okay. Oh my gosh. And that's because we were on the cold side of that system. Yeah, temperatures, a whole, a whole other thing. I mean, these systems produce winds and precipitation, but also this is what brings typically our big changes in our temperatures, our cold fronts that sometimes are stronger than others. It depends on the low pressure system, it depends on the cyclone. Yep, totally does. Not all cyclones are created equal. No. That's for sure. And bomb cyclones are not rare, by the way. They happen a lot. Mm -hmm but now we are more prepared for them than we were in the past. Yes. Woohoo! So. Once what, again, I'm not prepared for this part. You can go first. I don't know what to do here, except for just to say like, we're approaching fiesta season, mm -hmm. which is very busy for us. Um, fiesta, for those of you who don't know, is a two week long party in San Antonio. And we work for about two weeks and we just get out to go into the community and meet people and it's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so if you would like to meet Katie and I, we're going to be doing several medal giveaways, Fiesta medal giveaways, which yes. we're excited about. Um, I can look that up in a moment here to show when go we're going it. to give it uh, away Fiesta medals. Um, but anything you're excited about Fiesta with Katie? Um, I just, I really like how excited and happy everyone gets. Not that everyone's not happy all the time, but everyone's really excited around Fiesta. They're collecting medals. Yeah, Fiesta is a big, like Zara was saying, it's a big two-week party and it's different organizations. Everything from our NBA team, the Spurs, to us here at KSAT, to yeah. the Humane Society, to our volunteer fire departments. Um, this is a every event that goes on is raising money. Yes. Um, so Every time you go out and buy food from a vendor, it's raising money for that vendor, and they're either a charitable cause or a nonprofit or something like that. So it's yeah. we call it the party with a purpose, and and I, we it is a purpose for sure. It's a really good purpose. And yes. speaking of medals, Katie and I are giving away Fiesta medals on Wednesday, April tenth. Also that is on coming up. Wednesday, April seventeenth. And then again on Wednesday, April 24th. And we don't know exactly where we'll be yet, but we'll let you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. We appreciate yeah. it. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. Okay. Party on, Garth. Party on. <laughs> All right. And remember to weather, weather the weather, weather whatever the weather. weather.